All right. So as part of my Antioch graduate school experience, I got to intern in a public school classroom in Gilson, New Hampshire. During this internship, I had the unique opportunity to take over all the classes, from the mathematics to the sciences to the social sciences, and I decided to connect all the curriculum. And for a couple of months, we uh, explored New Hampshire nature and culture from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. And all of the subjects interwove together to tell us a story about New Hampshire. Libby, Paige, and some other of uh, classmates said the knowledge of how to hunt for different animals was relearned is often much healthier meat than what we buy at the store. The white-tailed deer is all around here. My dad hunts the white-tailed deer. My dad, when my dad hunts, he notes in his mind some things that he found from a deer he might find. We learned in this class how to survive off the land of New Hampshire. We learned that hunting and fishing would, wouldn't be sustainable if it was not for the state agencies like New Hampshire Fish and Game, who regular, regulate the hunt and stock of our fresh waterways with hatchery fish. We learned that stocking is good, particularly for us fishermen, but sometimes it threatens the wild fisheries, especially out west. The size trout. I'm a conservation officer in this area, and one of my responsibilities as a conservation officer is not just the enforcement of the fishing game rules and regulations, but I also, in the spring of the year, stock a lot of my waterways, ponds, uh, brooks, rivers, and the Ashwillet River being one of them, with about uh, 30,500 uh, brook trout, rainbows, and browns. And today just happens to be one of my stocking days for this area. And uh, so that's one of my responsibilities to get the fish out. Do you like your job? Love it. Been doing it for almost 29 years, wouldn't change a thing. Yeah, and uh, is it better than being in office? Definitely. This is a poem that I wrote. Ashwell River, I love you. All your water's cold and true. My house is almost a mile from you, and your water's cold and true. All animals, great and small, come to the sound of your call, of rumbling waters and great waterfalls. All the trees growing on your banks, to you they give all their thanks. Oh, Ashley River, I love you, and your water's cold and true. We learn how many Americans are alienated from the land and from each other. In our reading, My Side of the Mountain, and on our naturalist explorations in the woods, we learned a little about the place we live. When I was a fifth and sixth grader, I used to wonder, why? did birch trees, why do birch trees shed their bark? And so, in this class, we explored such things. When it expands and contracts, freezes, thaws, that's a lot of activity for the cellular structure of the birch tree. So in order to prevent that, in the winter time, it's white and it reflects the light off of the tree. So it gets, it maintains itself as a cooler tree, okay? So why might this bark flake off? Because it's, it's, it's cold. What do you notice about this bark right here compared to bark that's on a live birch tree? Be birch tree loses its bark sheds its bark to release its brand new white layer, so it remains white all the time. That's why we can collect um, the birch bark for fire. So all over New England, one of the most common things you see in the woods are these stone fences, stone walls running through the woods. And the reason why that they're, where they're here is because when Europeans came and settled in these forests, they cleared a lot of them and used them for pasture um, or for agriculture.
And based on the size of the stones, you can tell if the land was used for cultivation or for grazing. With a lot of just big stones, you know that the land was um, only cleared once and it was um, used for grazing. But if you see a wall with a lot of small stones, that means it was used for cultivation because every year when they would plow, they would take all the small rocks out of the earth and they would add them to the wall. We are the Gilsomers. We are the Gilsomers. The mighty, mighty Gilsomers. The mighty, mighty Gilsomers. Everywhere we go. Everywhere we go. People wanna know. People wanna know. If we farm. If we farm. And we live in New Hampshire. Oh, and we live in New Hampshire. And we live in New Hampshire. They are both true. They are both true. Are both true. Um. No, they are all true. No, they're mostly true. Right, New Hampshire has a rich agricultural history. In our New Hampshire and nature cultural class, we learned how family farms in our community have changed dramatically over the years. We learned from speaking with our elders in our community how we used to raise and grow our own food, especially before World War II. Now the family's farm exists in very few pockets in our community. We have, we got to visit a few of these sites as part of our class. A community with farms encourages a climate of cooperation and community values. Family farming communities like the Cold River CSA in Ackworth often help each other in times of need what's called draft horses. They're working horses. We use them for all the farm work. Come on girls, step up. I'm not sure of that, that tone of my voice. <laughs> A little, we're checking out what's going on here. Huh? We use them for all the farm work. We start, well in the winter we use them for logging and, uh, <coughs> and uh, moving cordwood for firewood. And uh, as soon as the Sugaring starts in February, end of February. We use them for getting the buckets out to the trees and breaking the, breaking the, packing the snow down. And, and then we gather sap as soon as the sap starts running. And this time of year, we use them for disking the fields, plowing. Um, and as soon as the uh, crops start to grow, we cultivate the fields with them between the rows of the crops. So do you think a person can live off the land here in New Hampshire? Yeah, sure. They always used to, and we do now. <laughs> Come on, Pop. Come on. It's so, just you have to change your, change your perspective. You know, you can't live, uh, you know, the kind of modern life that the media wants you to live. You have to, you have to pick and choose and, and live the way you want to live. We grow most of our own food. We use um, wood for fuel. We don't have any other fuel. Well, we use electric, but we don't have oil or gas that we use for fuel. And we make, make a lot of things with our hands. We built all our own buildings. We cut our wood. And, um, yeah, and then we sell surplus. You know, we get good at things, and then we can raise enough to have extras. And then we sell. We make enough syrup to sell, and, and Barbara's a potter. Come on, step over, Pop. Come on, step over. Hold, Vicky. Whoa. Come back now, Vicky. Hey, Vicky. Come back. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Whoa, whoa. Come back. Come back. Come on, Vicky. Back. Ho. Oh. Oh, now. We're committed to it. We love it. We're happy doing it. We have a good time, um, and it's a good thing to do, you know. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, I don't want to, there's lots of good things you can do in this world where there's, you know, a lot of crazy things going on, but growing food and protecting the land to me is, is of paramount importance. And, um, you know, we don't, we, we support ourselves. We don't depend on others to, to grow our food and, and supply all our needs. We, we supply as many of our needs as we can, and that's very satisfying. I thought this one farmer named Wendell Berry had a good idea when he wrote, 
We must cleanse ourselves of laziness and waste. We must learn to discipline ourselves, to restrain ourselves, to need less, to care more for others. We must understand what the health of the earth requires, and we must put that before all other needs. I don't think I will ever forget when Genevieve Lounder, who was the citizen of the year in Gilsom, came and told us how great it is to grow your own food and how in times like the Great Depression, it was all they had to survive. I think the most important thing I would say was to have a garden. I really think it's very important on the future of what might happen in the United States. If you have food, then you are well off. If you have to buy all your food and something happens that you can't get it, you're going to be in a bad position. There's a lot of wild plants that are edible. How many here have ever eaten dandelion? Dandelion is very, very healthy. It's one of the healthiest vegetables that you can eat. And well, when I cut the dandelion to eat it, sometimes you find those little tiny uh, flower buds inside, real small ones. Well, I saved all of them, and then I just put a little butter in the pan, a light and not very hot, and put all those tiny little buds of the, of the, of the dandelion in it, and they are absolutely delicious. This poem is Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles to the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. Visiting the Gilsom Historical Society and the, the Gilsom Village Store as part of the class made me think about how everywhere and everyone has their own history. History can be seen everywhere if we look, from a cemetery to a local deli. Everybody had their own garden. Everybody had their own chickens. If they grew, had their own eggs, their own meat from the chickens. Everybody might have a pig or a cow that they killed in the fall and had meat through the winter. You didn't go to the store and buy too much. You might go and buy a barrel of flour and maybe a bucket of peanut butter. The center quilt uh, was made by the Gilson <coughs> Crazy Quilters Club, and it is uh, appliqued pictures on, of cloth on the quilt and of different houses that are still here or were here. There's the old, the old schools are in there, the old brick schoolhouse is there, the old store is there. Um, you can see the Stone Arch Bridge. There's the, a red, uh, I think that's a schoolhouse. No, that's the Isham Farm, which is no longer here, but we had pictures of it. So we re re do, re re replicated the um, pictures on with cloth and made these, these uh, blocks for our quilt mm -hmm. and then gave it to the Historical Society. It's a lot of fun to do that. You, you kids ought to try it sometime just making pictures out of cloth. Take scraps of cloth and do all kinds of things with them. Lewis Wright, um, the girl that made those Lewis. quilts, his grave is right there. Page seven, stomach.
When this building was first built, it was 1828. Whoa. And it was initially used as a granary. People used to come here with their horses and wagons and get the grain in the back and then drive through. Well, then it switched over to a country store after that. And it's been in continuous operation ever since. It's never been closed. We haven't seen these things in the back, up on top, some of these pictures. These are some of the products that were originally sold in here. They don't exist anymore, but they're the, the labels on them. And up in the attic here, there's still some of those products we have in boxes up there that were in this store back in the 1800s. At one time, they used to weigh sides of beef in here, and they'd hang them up here and butcher them. And also, they, they used to weigh deer here at this uh, store in the back. And this is, this is years ago. But this is an antique uh, scale. It's quite old. That opens up on this floor, opens up on the next floor, and goes up into the attic. And there's a great big wheel up there with a chain and a pulley. And the bags of grain used to come all the way down from the attic to here. And what year was that? Oh, this would be in the 1800s. Welcome here, welcome here, we're meeting here today. We're bringing in the season, we're bringing in the May. Welcome here, welcome here, we're meeting here today. we learned how the natural and cultural history of New Hampshire is interconnected um, with the natural and cultural hi histories of far off places and far off times. For instance, a popular tradi tradition in New Hampshire, which our classmate Bodie acted in, is the Mummer's Play. In New Hampshire, this play happens on May 1st, or May Day. These plays have been acted by rural communities for centuries, starting first in England. The Mummer's Play is a folk play performed by everyday members of the community. play is from 1746, which was then performed at Christmas. May Day is a holiday celebrated all across New Hampshire. May Day originated in the pre-Christian Europe and was a festive hol holy day celebrating the first spring planting. May Day also signifies the right of passage into adulthood. Traditionally, young men and women would stay out in the forest to greet the May sunrise, making flower garlands to carry back and decorate the village. The Maypole dance is performed by boys and girls placed alternately in a ring. They then dance around in a circle with a colored ribbon in their hands, at the same time as twisting in and out of each other, creating a weaving around the Maypole. Bring your lasses in your hand, for tis that which love commands. Put it now all a day, then to the bay, go raised away. Put it now all a day. It's the choice time of the year. Most 
Demands we hear as she commands, for here we stand upon these lands we borrow from our children, the lands we plant our roots and seeds in. They are no one's possession, but a gift of creation. Please bear this in contemplation, the soil and the trees, the flowers and the bees, fed by the flowing streams and lit by the glowing beams, belong to one another, for each supports the other. And we, sisters and brothers, depend on all the others for our health and prosperity. Please view with clarity and sincerity the disparity between what it means to own and control and what it means to steward for the greater good of all. Like the air we share, Pan's words are clear. Those with ears, let them hear. Let the rain fall, and I scream now. You woke my dreams, you've shattered my screams. Let the rain fall, and wake my dreams. I want to hear the thunder, I want to scream. Let the rain fall, I'm coming. Have you ever seen a penguin drinking tea? Have you ever seen a penguin drinking tea? Take a look at me, penguin you will be. Take a look at me, a penguin you will see. Penguins attention! Penguins attention! Penguins begin! Penguins begin! Right flipper! Right flipper! Left flipper! Left flipper! Right Take your tail for me. Nod your head. Have you ever seen a penguin drinking tea? Have you ever seen a penguin drinking tea? Take a look at me, a penguin you will see. Take a look at me, a penguin you will see. That's the show. We got to dress up and pretend we were a person from history relating to the theme of New Hampshire nature and culture. My name is John Muir. I am an explorer, naturalist, and writer. My name is Tasha Tudor. I am the ghost of Sharon Chris McAuliffe. I was born on September 2, 1948. My name is Eunice Col Goody Cole. I was born in 1590. Um, My name is Robert Frost. I was born on March eighth in eighteen seventy four. It's Divergent Wood and I. I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. My name is Mary Baker Eddy and I was born in a farm in Bow, New Hampshire. I'm Ann Lee. I'm I um I'm an immigrant from Manchester, England and I I was a shaker. My name is Jonathan Daniels. I was a civil rights worker I am Alan Violet Shepherd Jr. I was born in East Derry, New Hampshire. <laughs> My name is John Paul Jones. I was born in 1747 and died in 1792. I am the ghost of Maxfield Parish. I was born in 1870. I am Franklin Pierce. I was born in 1804. What happened when Kelsey dressed up as Jacques Cousteau in snorkeling gear when the fire alarm went off? Monsieur Cousteau, viens ici, s'il vous plaît. Do you think Jacques Cousteau is a pretty cool guy? Yeah, because he helped. Um, show us a lot about the underwater world. We got to see one of the legends of contra dancing play his piano for the dancers in Nelson. His name is Bob McCollum. He recently celebrated his 50th anniversary playing contra dance music 
in New Hampshire and around the country. I've been playing contra dance music since 1947. I came home from World War II out of the Marines mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> out in the Pacific and came to a little old farm in New Boston, New Hampshire and where my mom was and the folks in the next town I happened to know they said you ever been to a square dance I said no this was in the summer 46 so anyway I went to this square dance over in Francistown with a real pretty girl two nice brothers good time time of my life loved it and got hooked do you know how it all started, how the square dancing or contra dancing? It started with Adam and Eve. <laughs> <laughs> well, they say that it came over with the Puritans. They came over from England. Rich man, poor man, bigger man, thief. No matter what. It's a lot of folks. They just have to come because they have fun. It's a universal gadget. It really is. It's very democratic. It's fun. F-U-N, <laughs> that's what it is. It's great fun. It's a happy, fun thing to do. Lots of nice people, meet folks, get to meet them, socialize. The cookies, <laughs> somebody's gonna bring, there's a bunch of cookies already downstairs. Um, and the music, but it's, it's fun to do. Another one of the places that we went to was Heeman Chase's house. The woman who was giving the tour was the daughter of Heeman Chase. All the mill owners were likely to fight over water because one person would need water and then the people upstream on the lake would need water and so there was always a quarrel over, over um, letting water come down, down the stream. Don't that's the foundation, me. and that's when the mill was in operation. It was a basically a sawmill. There was about four other mills all along the brook. We also visited the Orchard Hill Bakery. At the bakery, they used a very unique oven when they cook. The oven that they use is made of stones, and it's very stable. Molly Ockett was an Abenaki healing woman. Her Indian name was Singing Bird, and her Christian name was Marie Agatha. You never marry a woman who doesn't love flowers. Or trust a person who hates music or children. <laughs> when you find yourself in, a bad, in bad company, I ask you to get out at once and remember as you pass through life your greatest troubles will be found due to ignorance. Tom Wessels told me about this, taught us about this place and he was kind of checking it out maybe 20 years ago or something and um, found a spot and was wondering what it was and in the town records they have it um, listed as old, an old pig trough 
like back from when Europeans settled here. Um, but it doesn't make sense for it to be a pig trough because it has like these huge slabs of schist as the ceiling and then these, you know, giant rocks as the walls and who would put all that effort into making a pig trough? It doesn't make any sense. Um, and also, um, it's too small um, to really house any animals. There are a couple of really interesting things about this spot. That um, trough right there um, was obviously carved in the bedrock that is coming out of the soil. And, you know, somebody probably sat there and just took a rock and went over and over and over that a million times. And, you know, you'd have to wonder, like, why would someone put a trough right there? Is it pointing at something important? Um, and so Tom came out here for the winter and summer solstice and the spring and fall equinoxes for years at sunrise and sunset to see if it was pointing at the sun, like rising at a certain place. And um, on a clear morning on the winter solstice, if you're inside of the chamber, the sun rises on the ridge over there, directly above where this points. So if you like put your eye at the bottom of the trough and look, you can see the sun rising above that point. And so it basically marks the longest night of the year, which the Abenaki called the Feast of All Dreams, and it would be the best day for contacting um, ancestors. And so whoever used the site would have to be like a shaman or um, a very important spiritual person because it would be something that would be important for the people to know. And in the woods, a um, quarter of a mile that way, which we're going to walk to in a little bit, um, there's a tree that points to this spot right here. And the tree itself has, is at least 400 years old. So that means that this site is at least 400 years old, but probably a lot older. Mm -hmm. And this tree was a sapling. You see how its trunk is split, like really close down to the base of the trunk? What happened was when it was a sapling, um, someone cut it down the middle. And you see how the one side creates an elbow? Well, they pinned that side down so that it would point a um, quarter mile through the forest to that site that we just were at. Our home, planet Earth, is finite. All life shares its resources and the energy from the sun and therefore has limits to growth. For the first time, we have touched those limits. Then we compromise the air, the water, the soil, the, the variety of life. We steal from the endless future to share the fleeting present. So, I think the answer is where we're going to you know, have true progress, we have to embrace these ancient values that were inherent in hunting-gathering groups. I'm not saying we become hunting-gatherers, but we need to have vibrant connections to community. We need to be definitely connected to our place so we care about it and we steward it. We need rich traditions that link that community to the place, and we need time for reflective practice so we can generate understanding of the world around us and be fulfilled by that understanding. And if we can do that, we don't need the consumption. We can be very fulfilled by that experience of life. Hi, my name is Stephen Rockefeller, and I understand that uh, the fifth and sixth grade at Gilsom Elementary School has been studying care for the earth and how to be good stewards at this very critical time in American and world history. And I want to encourage you to study closely the Earth Charter. The Earth Charter is a document and a declaration of fundamental principles for building a just, a sustainable, and a peaceful world. And that will mean a healthier, and a happier, and a freer place for you and me and everybody else who lives on this planet. And I hope very much that you will take to heart everything you're learning today and remember respect and care for the greater community of life and have a wonderful life. Thank you. Silence has a power to it and here, as we're exploring the island, I can hear the birds. I can hear the wind and the leaves of the trees. And we have learned in our class how special trees are. 
And my favorite day was when we got to present the first graders with their very own eastern white pine trees. If you look deep enough, you can still see today where the Lorax once stood just as long as it could before somebody lifted the Lorax away. I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. Plant a new trufala. And in Gilsum, they're also known as white <coughs> pine trees. So treat it with care. Give it clean water and feed it fresh air. Grow a forest. Protect it from axes that hack. Then the Lorax and all of his friends may come back. The best thing about being in nature is you can have fun. Diana Tishnika, Diana Tishnika, Diana. Diana Tishnika, Diana Tishnika, Diana. Diana Tishnika, Diana Tishnika, Diana Tishnika, Diana. Thank you, fifth and sixth graders, for a wonderful semester. And if you guys learn something, and you guys had fun, then I think you all deserve A pluses. And if you didn't, then I think you guys all deserve C pluses.
It doesn't matter how old we are. We are always surrounded by beauty.